from Guadalajara, Mexico, in the International Congress of Identity. We are sharing this side, this book with uh, Mark Weber. Weber is well study, well knowledge, oh, well knowledge of uh, the, Arge the Jewish question. He talked about recently about the uh, challenge we have to face on it. And I would like, Mr. Weber, thank you for being with us in TLB1 from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I would like you to explain us how is this challenge you spoke today. There's no power in America of any ethnic or religious group that can match the power of the organized Jewish community in the United States. In my talk, I gave numerous examples of, how, of confirmation of this tremendous power in the United States. And because this Jewish Zionist power has such tremendous uh, grip on our American foreign policy, it has consequences for the entire world as well and has played a role in the Iraq War in 2003, in the continuing U.S. support for Israel over the years, oppression of Palestinians, uh, the call for new wars in Syria and Iran and so forth. This is, has very dangerous consequences, of course, not only for the United States, but for the entire world. And I try to uh, show from even, I think, irrefutable sources uh, that, the, that this is a real reality and that because this power is so great and because the impact of this power is uh, so harmful to non-Jews and to everybody except Israel, it's very, very important to identify it, to understand it, and to counter it. When you find about the power or the challenges, that's because the financial sector is on uh, Zionist hands and, and they you know, impose in others what their views of materialism and everything related? The power is in many different sectors, but perhaps the most important is control of the media. The American media has what I would say a Judeo-centric flavor. That is, anything that's going, to, any uh, views that are going to be uh, considered harmful to Israeli interests or the interests of the organized Jewish community are essentially prohibited in the United States. It's true that sometimes criticism of Israeli policies is permitted, and sometimes occasionally American politicians will criticize a particular Israeli policy. But overall, criticism of Israel as a Jewish state and its overall um, policies is not permitted in the United States. But the control of the media is especially a strong one. It, there's also very, in, very strong power in the financial sector and also in political life. As I showed, uh, the single largest contributor to, um, and donator to political candidates in recent elections have been have been Jewish, Haim Saban, Sheldon Adelson, and others. And it's especially significant because uh, the money that's given by wealthy Jewish donors and by Jewish organizations and so forth is focused on Jewish interests in a way that's not true of many other donors. Many of those who give donations who are non-Jews do so for, oh, they have a specific interest and so forth, but they do not have the um, uh, communitarian identity and agenda and focus that the Jewish community has, which gives tremendous power, especially in the United States, because the U.S. is a country with a very, very individualistic mentality. And in a country of people who think of themselves only as individuals, a group with a strong community sense, as the organized Jewish community in America has, is all the more powerful and strong. Do you believe America in general is Judaized uh, or, or or the brain that uh, monitors, you know, that moves all this uh, has other way, other places where it's being studied or th thinking, I would say. Well, I'll give two examples. Just um, a little over a year ago, uh, Vice President Joe Biden made the point that the social political changes of the last hundred years have been overwhelmingly the result of Jewish influence. That's what the Vice President said. I mean, uh, I, I don't think there's anybody who's in a better position to know about that than him. He declared himself Zionist. Oh, yes. He's very, very much supporter of Israel. He's an ardent supporter of Israel. He wouldn't have advanced in political life unless he was like this. But even more, the culture of America has been very, very heavily Jewish influenced uh, to, the, to almost a ridiculous point, to the point where it's considered quite 
permissible to uh, mock and uh, belittle and scorn Christian traditions or European traditions, uh, but it's not permitted in America to do that same thing with uh, Jewish or traditions or certainly Israel in the same way. But life in America has been very, very heavily Jewish influenced in a way that uh, many even Jewish writers have acknowledged. But I, again, I cite the, the vice president who himself acknowledges, he says, the social changes that have taken place have been above all, first and foremost, the result of Jewish power and influence in the United States. Is there some kind of privatized this, this power, like uh, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group? How can you tell us something about it? The Trilateral Commission and Bilderberger Group and similar groups are, represent uh, moneyed interests of uh, wealthy people, corporations, politicians, and so forth, but it doesn't have anywhere near the focus that powerful Jewish groups do, such as the Anti-Defamation League, uh, the America-Israel Public Affairs uh, Committee, lobby, and so forth. These are very focused on Jewish concerns. Organizations like the Trilateral Commission, Bilderberger, and so forth, uh, they are more broad. And in fact, there's disagreement within it. Um, uh, oh, to take one example, there are many American interests that are not in favor of uh, United States wars on behalf of Israel. But uh, they do not have anywhere near the influence and power that the Israeli or uh, Jewish lobby does when they uh, decide on a policy and stick with it. Um, but th there's not a, uh, there is a difference of, of, of interest and opinion between corporate interests or uh, sometimes American, might say corporate interests on the one hand and Jewish interests on the other. For example, uh, the major oil companies, major American corporations were not in favor of the 2003 invasion of Iraq, despite what many people think that it was a war for oil. In fact, America got no oil out of the whole thing. Um, and Israel's goal was really not to bring democracy to Iraq. Israel's goal was just to destroy a regime and a government that was a rival, a threat to Israeli interests and Israeli power. Uh, but uh, there are uh, differences of, uh, I mean, very often American politicians want, you might say, to increase America's power and influence in the world, their corporate influence, um, and they would like a kind of hegemony as they've had in the past. Uh, the Jewish interest is somewhat different, the Israeli interest is somewhat different. They are not so interested in American hegemony as very specifically what's going to benefit the Jewish community in, in Israel. Now, if it wasn't the interest of, of petroleum or oil, uh, invading Iraq and Libya, etc. Uh, what is the other interest that they have in the area? Well, we know that the uh, public reasons given by the Bush administration for going to invading Iraq were false. He claimed that Iraq was a threat to the United States, they had these dangerous weapons, all that, we know that. And we, but uh, some people who are critical of the war claim it was a war for oil. There's no evidence of that, really. Um, oil companies were not in favor of it. People who wanted oil from Iraq could have gotten it much more cheaply by just buying it. If they wanted to invade a country with oil, they could more easily invade Venezuela than Iraq. The, as I pointed out in my talk yesterday, and as there's much a documentation this, of this on our website, uh, the key, the crucial factor was that this war benefited the interests of Israel. And this has been documented by many, many people. And I cited some people who made this point. I cited a member of the British House of Commons uh, who is a venerable member. I cited an American senator who admitted this privately. And this is admitted privately by, by many people because there's no other really clear interest that makes any sense. Um, it certainly wasn't benefiting ultimately the United States or the American people. It was a costly, disastrous war. It benefited no one really, except really uh, Israel in getting rid of a country that was a rival. Where do you think the brain or the planning is settled? Where in the world? Or is moving around the world? Well, there, there, sometimes people will think, well, there's one central uh, group or so forth. It doesn't operate like that because the Jewish community uh, is not centralized in that sense. But that makes it all the more dangerous because it's, it's a community. It represents uh, a kind of consensus of interests. Now, uh, there's a very powerful Jewish organizations and, and uh, leaders in the United States, but that works very closely, of course, with Israeli leaders, because Israel claims to speak not merely on behalf of the citizens of its country, but on behalf of world Jewry. Netanyahu has claimed repeatedly 
that he speaks as a leader of Jews everywhere, which raises a very interesting point, because if that's true, if a person believes in Zionism, then American Jews, by definition, cannot really be loyal to the United States of America. Their loyalty is to the Jewish community or to Israel. Um, but the Israeli community operates very well, and the Jewish community, I mean, by, operates very well as a kind of consensus. They agree on policies, and uh, it's manifest in a number of different organizations, such as the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations, the America-Israel uh, Public Affairs Committee, and um, sometimes more specifically by individuals, like Abraham Foxman of the ADL, Sheldon Adelson, of course, uh, Haim Saban and others uh, who, who play this very important role. But it does not operate in the strict way that you might expect it would. We saw recently the, the President Netanyahu, or Prime Minister Netanyahu, visiting the U.S. Congress. And uh, he challenged the Obama power in an agreement with Iran. He was received a standing ovation. And how can you read from, uh, from all that... Uh, Right. The, the um, Israeli leaders have spoken before the Congress more than the leaders of any other single country, including Netanyahu and um, uh, other Israeli leaders. In fact, Netanyahu has spoken to the U.S. Congress as many times as Winston Churchill. And it's the first time a leader will come from another country even to criticize the policy of America. In fact, the uh, tumultuous applause, these repeated dozens of standing ovations that, Obama, that Netanyahu has gotten from the U.S. Congress is a real expression of the tremendous grip that uh, the Jewish community has on American political life because American congressmen really don't care about Israel. They care about being reelected. It's a form of, it's a, a symbol of corruption. In fact, they applaud Netanyahu more than they would even President Obama, the president of their own country, and Netanyahu is applauded more than he is by uh, Jews in the Israeli parliament. It's, it's, it's a perverse thing. And future generations will look back on it as an example of the corruption and decadence, really, of American life in the beginning of the 21st century that this is happening. Um, but uh, with regard to... there, <clears throat> You have to remember, though, that even within the uh, Jewish community and even within Israel, there are many Jews who do not agree with Netanyahu about Iran. This is not an argument. The, the, the dispute between uh, the Obama administration and Iran is not an argument about uh, doing what's good for, uh, is not an argument about support for Israel. It's an argument about which is best for Israel. In fact, many Israelis and even many American Jews think Israeli interests are better served by making this deal because the only real alternative uh, to this agreement, which, by the way, isn't just between the United States and, and Iran, it's also between Iran and many other countries, this, the only real alternative is war. If, if you aren't going to make a deal, then the alternative is war. It makes no sense not to have an agreement. The United States made agreements with the Soviet Union, it made agreements with, with communist China, which uh, actually had nuclear weapons. Iran doesn't even have nuclear weapons. But the Netanyahu government is not really worried about nuclear weapons. What Netanyahu is really worried about is the existence of a country, of a state, that is strongly opposed to Israel and is strongly supportive of Palestinians and liberation of people from Israeli and Zionist rule. We go straight, quietly, slow, but uh, direct to the new world order. Uh, what role are going to play these people? I mean, wh wh what is the role for them? Well, they're the, controlling the whole, the whole world itself, or, or, or is just influence around the world? Well, there uh, increasingly around the world there is um, uh, disagreement with the United States. Increasingly, more and more countries are moving away from the United States. If we look at the uh, trajectory of history over the past 40, 50 years, we can see that America's power and influence in the world has, in relative terms, decreased. Remember, during the 1950s, Iraq, uh, Iran, um, Pakistan, they were all essentially puppets of the United States. They were controlled. They were under United States uh, rule. But around the world, there is increasingly uh, um, a difference of, of, of interests and of policy between the United, what's good for the United States. In the Iraq War in 2003, uh, 
all, the only European country that went along was Britain, and, he, and Britain did so against the wishes of the people of Britain. France, Germany, the other countries refused to go along. And we see, of course, the rise of China as an important um, counterweight to the United States. But this should be kept in context because the United States is still, by far, the number one military power in the world. And America is therefore obliged to use its power in a military, in a forceful way, in a violent way, more than it did in the past. It's still a very important cultural power. That's what they call soft power, and that's important. And, of course, the financial power is still great of the United States. The United States is still the number one financial country, and especially because the dollar is essentially still the major reserve currency of the world. So American power is still considerable. But um, America's ability to uh, impose its will on other countries is less. Um, at the end of the Second World War, the United States' power was immense compared to the rest of the world. Something like 95% of the automobiles made in the world were made by the big three automobile companies of Detroit. Today, China alone makes more automobiles than Japan and the United States combined. Things have changed very, very drastically during the last 40, 50 years, and we're going to see a continuation of this. And this means that Israel and the organized Jewish community in the United States will have to resort, will be obliged to resort ever more to war and violence to get its way rather than um, uh, peaceful relations with other countries. Do you believe that either China and Russia has been, uh, are submitted to this power itself or are they going to make a challenge to this power? Well, let's well, they are part of the let's show. Take each one. Uh, Russia has uh, a, ha had a policy that is trying to uh, promote Russian interests. It does not want, I think, certainly war with the United States, but it has a definite idea of its interests, especially in countries bordering immediately on its uh, around its borders. Um, China, Russia is not so powerful. Uh, it has to. Um, it, it, it's not so strong, so it has to be careful. But I think the big challenge is going to be the next several years in the relationship of Russia and Europe, because the interests of Russia and Europe basically uh, are, are, are good. Uh, they are um, complementary interests, and especially Germany and Russia and France and so forth can cooperate, and they have to live to each, with each other. They do not want, no, nobody really wants a war over Ukraine. The United States is willing to push things even to the extent of war. That's Russia. In the case of China, China, for at least the next 10 or 15 years, will be trying to work for peace because uh, it's in the interest of China to continue the very good, rela profitable relations with the United States. China uh, has holds large amounts of debt of the United States. China, uh, the United States is a major market for Chinese uh, products. And it's not in China's interest to have a showdown or a conflict with the United States. So its interest is to continue more or less the kind of relationship with the United States while at the same time increasing its uh, position and its uh, economic ties with the Middle East, with uh, Europe, uh, with South America and Africa and so forth. But uh, so for the next 10 years, I think that will remain relatively stable. The big question mark, I think, in the world is the role of Europe. Because after World War II, uh, Europe, Western Europe was basically under American hegemony. But the interests of Europe, not what they think is right, but the interests of Europe are going to diverge increasingly from that of the United States. It's not in anyone's interest to support the uh, policies of the United States in recent years, the war of Iraq, a confrontation with with Russia and so forth. So um, that's going to be the biggest thing, and that will be Europe is going through immense uh, struggle right now because, as I pointed out in a talk earlier today, uh, there is a real crisis of confidence throughout Europe in the traditional parties that have governed, and a sense of malaise, a sense of anxiety about what Europe is and what it's going to be. The same malaise is also taking place in the United States too. One of the big things about the world to remember is that a country that claims to be a leader in the world um, must also be a society that people at least respect. The, when the British Empire was at its height, people might not like the oppression, but London and Britain was impressive. Young uh, uh, men in India wanted their sons to be like Englishmen. At the height of the Roman Empire, 
people in Gaul or Anatolia or on the outskirts, they were impressed by Rome because it was a, a magnificent achievement. But in the world today, no one thinks that their society should be modeled after the United States. Nobody says, I want our cities to be like Chicago. The United States is not a model society. It has immense problems internally, uh, cultural, racial, economic, uh, disparities of income, and uh, states in the same way that they did in the 50s or the 60s. In the 50s or 60s or 70s, America was still the wealthiest country. But now that's no longer the case. People live better in other countries. And we're going to see increasingly this uh, trend continuing. And we will, and therefore, it's going to be harder and harder for the United States to be a, uh, a, a formidable or an effic effective leader or um, uh, imperial power if people do not even re respect it. And that's increasingly the case. We know that they are powerful all over the world. On the other side, we are weak. We don't have that strength to fight. I mean, we got the strength to fight, but we have not, we, are, we got the doubt to succeed. Yeah. At least, if we believe in, in Christianity, definitely the good will triumph. Yeah. But in the meantime, what do you think is the way out? Well, I put a, I think that each, one of the important things is to fight the efforts by the United States to make all the other countries of the world like the United States. People, it's, identity is important, and that's the theme of this conference. Because unless we are true to ourselves, we cannot be true to anything. And uh, I think it's important that all countries around the world uh, derive strength from their own heritage and traditions and not try to copy the United States or copy especially a country that is so uh, lacking in traditions. It means resisting these forces of uh, equalization, of obliteration of culture, of eradication, of, um, and that's one thing. But in, in all of this, I think conferences like this, and I think uh, educational work is very important, to understand the very issues that we're talking about here today so that people then can deal with them. And to uh, not be seduced, you might say, by the, well, seductive, um, uh, 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 power of uh, right of the values that the United States and promote because they are seductive. That is, they're attractive because they're saying, "Oh, just take it easy. Oh, forget about who you are. Uh, be uh, don't be uh, uh, concerned about honor, respect, tradition. Don't worry about any of those things. Um, those are all seductive, but they're also harmful and dangerous." Mr. Weber, uh, just to finish. Uh, do you think, I mean, your life is at risk talking about these things in, in America, in the United States? It's less of a risk than it used to be because um, the, yeah, it's true that um, organizations like the ADL and other Jewish groups are very hostile, but it's also important to remember that the number of people and groups who they do not like is growing all the time. It, now, there, it, uh, there are so many people who are opposed to this power that we are one of many, many uh, organizations and just a small part of a larger growing awareness around the world that this power that I've been talking about is harmful. And for example, there's a very large movement all over the United States and the world against, uh, against investment in Israel to say we should boycott Israel. And Israel is very worried about this. It's uh, obtaining great support on campuses around the United States. All over the world, there's an awareness of this growing. And um, that's why we are just now not as important an enemy, you might say, for these groups as we were, say, 10 or 20 years ago. But at the same time, I think we are making more of an impact and effectiveness, and that's all to the good. Very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. You're welcome. Thank you from Juan Manuel Suárez from Guadalajara, Mexico, for uh, TLV1 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. <laughs>